Hi everyone, this is Neil with Rock Our World. So is this going to be the last time I talk to you? Uh, or are there a dozen other scenarios that will unfold in front of us? Because we, uh, we see through a glass <clears throat> darkly. But the Lord has shown us through his word that <clears throat> as we get closer and closer to the time of the fulfillment of all things that we would understand and that uh, the Lord did say that he would do nothing except he reveals uh, what he's going to do ahead of time to his servants, the prophets. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it uh, begs the question, who is the servant of God? This is probably a good time to say this again. I've brought these scriptures up many times. It's uh, Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24. Now Ezekiel all the way from 40 to 48. I'm going to say, and again I want to remind people I'm speaking out of my own opinion. But I have taken time to study the scriptures for these past 46 years. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not the superstar. That would be Yeshua, our Savior. But he did say these things. And step one is you have to read the scriptures and then read them enough times and study them long enough uh, to, and have the Holy Spirit explain them to you before you can say you understand the things of God. You can't just go to a Bible school and listen to what they taught you or a yeshiva uh, and uh, regurgitate what you're taught and say, this is what God says. You can't do that. You have to read it. And you have to go through the process of having the Holy Spirit explain it to you. Now, I've done the best I could. No, I, I'm sure I could have done better, but I've I've done all these things, and here I am on YouTube. This is the door the Lord put before me, and this is what I'm saying. These are some of the things I've found. So between Isaiah, Ezekiel 40 and 48, what God is describing is what is going to be going on during the thousand years. See, the thousand years is a temporary part of the kingdom of God. It's the... I, I, the word experiment almost fits, but it's an experiment with with an exact result. God knows exactly what the result of this experiment will be. So it's not quite the right word, but <clears throat> what God is doing is he's taking physical human beings. He's removing Satan completely for 1,000 years. Uh, and then he's going to, insist. In, in fact, we could call it a dictatorship. We're going to be forced to keep all of God's instructions. All of them. And when you read Ezekiel 40 to 48, you, you take a, um, a glimpse isn't the right word, but you, you see a picture of what's going to be going on. And within that, God explains what a true teacher of God will be doing. He'll be doing four things. She, he, she. So a true teacher does these four things. He, she uh, teaches the difference between the godly and the profane teaches the difference between the clean and the unclean, which are not <clears throat> good uh, English words. They're not a good translation from the Hebrew. It, it uh, would be, uh, I've said this before, but on, on clean uh, would be best translated in English, out of quite a number of English words, would be best translated a temporary loss 
of the freedom to go into the inner court. And that is where God resides in the inner court, in the Holy of Holies. So if you become unclean, uh, either accidentally or on purpose, <laughs> through ignorance or just rebellion, then you, in most cases, cannot go into the inner court until sunset. So you're banned, <laughs> banned. You've lost your freedom for for uh, a, a day. So, you know, the penalty doesn't sound that great. But see, if you're continually disobedient, and I've pointed this out, if you eat a piece of pig every day, you continually uh, lose the freedom to go into the inner court. Now, the Lord can still see, hear you yelling from the outer court. <laughs> That's what your prayers would uh, kind of, in essence, would look like because you're, you're banned, not banned. You've lost your freedom. Anyway, uh, so that's the second thing a true teacher teaches, the difference between the clean and the unclean. And the idea is that you, uh, you understand God's instructions, all the details, and that you make efforts constantly in your life uh, to keep yourself in that place of holiness using God's instructions. And of course, uh, I, I like picking on pigs because it, it's such a silly thing. What's hard about not eating a pig? Like, why do we love pigs so much that we've got to eat pigs? It's just a dumb thing. I I haven't eaten any pig since I was about, well, 20. That's when uh, God introduced himself to me, and I started embracing some of the things that he has written in his word. And it hasn't hurt me one bit not to eat a pig. It, it hasn't cramped my lifestyle. It, uh, the only time it runs into a bit of problem is if you're invited somewhere and the, the uh, host doesn't know you don't eat pigs and serves you pigs. And in that case, I have eaten uh, the pig and become unclean for a day or until sunset. Uh, so I don't offend that host. And it's not like a big deal. And then... Uh, and I've done this also, then I've explained later to that host that this is what uh, I do and don't do. I don't eat pork. And in most cases, they're like very understanding and and uh, had wonderful results in, in many cases. If you do it in that, uh, in love. Anyway, <clears throat> let's carry on with these four things. The third thing that a true teacher of God does is he, he she, she, he uh, makes correct decisions based on the Torah of God. And the Torah is something very specific. It's about 600 separate uh, instructions of which only a smaller part of that will apply to you. And you will figure out which ones apply to you simply by reading them. And you want to read them, you know, regularly enough that you get more insight into what you're not supposed to be doing and what you are supposed to be doing. And then the fourth thing, which is written right into the Torah itself, but God points it out specifically. You are to keep, uh, or the, the true teacher is to teach the appointed times of the Lord. And I have... I started by saying there's nine of them, and then I bumped it to ten with uh, the addition of Lamb Selection Day, which was always there. I just didn't see that until more recently. And then, of course, I pointed out that the Great Tribulation itself is an appointed time. So that makes 11 appointed times. And if you go to Genesis 1.14, you see that all of the appointed times are illustrated to us and and uh, shown when they are by a sign from either the sun, the moon, or the stars. And then if we go to Enoch, chapter 72 to 80, we see that the sun points out, illustrates, demonstrates, shows us 
when the 12 months of the year are and they're 30 days each. He doesn't go ahead and say what the moon is for. So using logic, we see the moon points has a distinct sign every seventh day for a 28 day cycle. So I'm going to explain this a little bit differently than I have before. The moon appears to us for 28 days regularly. So that's why I say a 28 day cycle. And then it disappears from view for either one or two days. That one or two days is the new moon festival. And the 28 days that we're able to see it are the 28 days of four week cycles, a week cycle. <laughs> I don't know if those are correct, good words, but we've got a moon cycle of 28 days. It's broken down into four seven day parts, which are weeks. And there's a distinct sign at the end of each week. And uh, we can learn all that from the Book of Enoch. And so now, saying all those things, let's back up. That's what a true teacher will say and do and teach. So now you go uh, back to your situation. You know, if you go to a church or a synagogue or you regularly uh, listen to the, the teachings, uh, preachings, prophecies, so on, of particular people, and they don't do those four things, then they are not a true teacher. Okay, now, I'm going to tackle something I've thought of quite a number of times here. I'll try and make it brief. I, starting, uh, I'm going to say about three years ago, I started encouraging people to listen to certain prophetic people. You know, they would have regular prophecies, and it sounded like, you know, they were speaking words directly from God. And I came to see that uh, some of these, you know, one at a time, <laughs> were being directly disobedient to God in, in the words that they were speaking. And so then I... Uh, it took time, but I just I st stopped recommending them. And uh, that whole thing has progressed, you know, as time has progressed. And I'm down to actually just one person that I would recommend wholeheartedly, and that is Julie Wedby. <clears throat> she regularly refers to the appointed times of the Lord. And she regularly points out that we are to keep the commandments of God. And she doesn't break it down into <laughs> commandments that somehow got done away with and commandments that we're still supposed to keep because there is no listing in Scripture of, of such things. Christianity just made that stuff up. And as I pointed out, it was the angel of light that created this theology where this other Jesus came along and he said, well, I just did away with the law. That was another Jesus. That was the one that the angel of light brought to us. The real Jesus, whom I refer to as Yeshua, and I, I think uh, Julie re, uh, pronounces it Yahushua. It is a Hebrew word that means salvation. Uh, that real Jesus did not do away with any of God's uh, commandments within the Torah. He kept them all to every detail, and he told us that we're to emulate him. That's uh, the Aramaic in the book of Revelation in speaking to the Laodicean church. If you want to go look it up, and uh, most Greek translate mistranslations, I call them, don't uh, carry through with a good English word from the Hebrew. So, not sorry, Hebrew, yes, Hebrew. <laughs> I was going to say correct it to Aramaic, but I am have a I have a confidence that the book of Hebrew was written 
the book of Revelation was written in Hebrew. And I explained that in my last two uh, episodes, pointing out the Olaf Tav, that word, that mystery word that Yeshua explained to us. That's a Hebrew word, Olaf Tav. He did not say Alpha Omega. He is not Greek. He's Hebrew, which means to cross over. Anyway, let's not get down a rabbit trail. So back to, uh, I f as fully as a human can be endorsed, I endorse Julie Wedby because of those reasons. Now, I have also uh, remained uh, supporting, you know, encouraging people to listen to God's Healer 7's messages. But uh, as far as I know, they rarely or if ever re refer to the point in times of the Lord. And I don't think the, you know, the greater mysteries of God, uh, they have, they have them. They, they have, they're not conscious of some of the greater mysteries that have been revealed more recently. But that doesn't change a person's heart. I think their, my own opinion is their hearts are pure. And their messages, uh, as, as best I can see, are reasonably accurate. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to do is point that these two things out that a true teacher will teach these four things and if they're not then be be suspicious <laughs> and what happens and this is me speaking this is my opinion that when God gives gifts to us he doesn't wait for us to become perfect <laughs> otherwise none of us would have gifts but having a gift or like prophecy or gifts comes along with a responsibility and that is to study the scriptures uh, diligently and long enough and with the help of the Holy Spirit which you want to be filled with you ask for these things you ask for understanding of scripture you ask for an infilling of the Holy Spirit you do these things this is active that's your responsibility. And if you don't do those things, or if you and I don't do those things, then we have a gift that can be used by Satan. Because until we study the scriptures and correctly divide them, until we have gone through that process, which takes time, we cannot hear the voice of God clearly. It's a, it's a process, and it's a responsibility. So I'm going to say the vast majority of so-called prophets, and you can add all the rest, whether, you, whether people call themselves um, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, preachers, pastors, what, uh, lay members, what, whatever you, you and I call ourselves, if we haven't uh, done our due diligence and... and uh, been responsible in learning these things, then we can be used by Satan and it turns into witchcraft. We won't, we will think we're hearing from God, but we'll be hearing from our enemy, the angel of light. Okay, now said. Now, what I want to do now, okay, I, I better finish the week count where we just got a few five days left this is the beginning so by the time this is uploaded and you a few of you get to hear this will be four days left to complete the seventh week in this count so that's what they were doing in the book of acts they were not preparing for pentecost that's greek mistranslation that's a word that was invented by the greeks the greek team <laughs> the, uh, what I call, uh, Constantine and cohorts. They created lies, inserted them into the Greek manuscripts. Anyway, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, 
they were following God's instructions. They were counting out seven weeks. The moon tells us where the weeks are. And here we are at the very last one. We're in the seventh one. And we're going to uh, end up with a full moon. That's the second sign of the four in a, in a moon cycle, in a 28-day moon cycle, uh, separating it from the new moon festival of one or two days. Just for the, I'm doing this for the aid of, there's, a, there's always a few people who understand more clearly if, I, if we get it explained to us in a different way. So we have this distinct 28 days that are made up of four weeks. What we're looking at now is the most distinctive of them. So I'm going to say the Lord is adding some things to this to make it more clear, more dramatic, easier to see. And uh, I dare say he, if, if indeed this is the end of one line and the beginning of another, there's something dramatic is going to happen here on the Feast of Weeks that he's going to clear the skies for everybody on earth. So everybody gets to see this full moon. And it is quite dramatic when the, the, the evening of the full moon, and I'll, I'll try and explain it properly this time. On that evening, and Enoch describes this, the full moon comes up in the eastern sky at the same time as the sun goes down in the western sky. They're simultaneous. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not to this split second, but it's very dramatic to watch. You know, most people are, you know, they're unaware of these things, so they don't, they might get to see it once in a lifetime, but it actually happens. Every, every moon cycle, 12.33 times a year, approximately. And then, as Enoch describes, the, the next morning, so this is talking about Sabbath morning. Sabbath starts at sunset. You see this dramatic thing with, with the moon coming up, the sun going down, and there are these big, full balls in the sky looking at each other. Well, not looking at each other. They're simultaneous. One's going down, one's coming up. The next morning, they look at each other. And those are the words that Enoch uses in the book of Enoch. And they look at each other, and I'm going to say for about an hour. None of these timings are exact because they're a little different as we progress around the globe. But it's all close enough we know. We can know almost all the time exactly when the Sabbath is. And the, uh, the time that we're on the international dateline, as I've described, you can pick either day, but you'll, you'll develop a system. You get a community together. This will, will eventually happen. As the days ahead of us unfold, there will be places of safety, and, and the, t the teachers will be there for you. Uh, just like in the thousand years, the teachers will be there. God will send people to help, to teach. Anyway, in your community, you, you will start watching these signs and you'll know when the Sabbath day is. And you'll develop a, a, an in-house system and you can have a few people on the committee, you know, elect, appoint them, not elect them, appoint them, you know, just whoever has that interest. And they will uh, watch for the signs while other people are taking care of other duties, you know, looking after the garden, looking after the cattle, and so on, you know, growing the, the grain, that's what I do on my farm, grow grain, uh, weed, weed the, you know, look, at, look after these things. That, those are the kind of things that will go on in these places. Safety will need food. So, uh, anyway. Where was it going with all this? So back to, we're finishing this count. We have been shown enough details. We're gonna have a dramatic, what I call the most dramatic sign of all the four of them in the moon cycle, the full moon. And then we have completed seven weeks. Seven sevens always means a Jubilee cycle, always. It's as obvious 
as the nose on her face. And uh, even that being said, I didn't see it until a few years ago. But reading the book of Jubilees really cements it. And in my opinion, the book of Jubilees is part of the Word of God. It's just as important as, as the five books put together called the Torah. It's just as important as the prophets, all the writings, the, ap the apostolic writings, the, the book of Revelation. It's equally important. It was written by God and it's for us. Same thing for the uh, book of Enoch. And then I've also recommended the book of Jasher. It has important details in it that we need. And then there's four other books I recommend, which I've done many, many times. All found in Joseph Lumpkin's Lost Books of the Bible, Great Rejected Texts. Okay, now back to, we finish the count. So we know when the Sabbath is. Then as per the instructions in Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16, Numbers 28 and 29, Jubilee 6, and various other places, the book of Acts chapter 2. Um, then the very next day after this count is complete is the Feast of Weeks. Now, what can we expect to happen? This is a speculation that God will pour out his spirit. And that's what happened in the book of Acts in what I'll call a small way compared to what he told us would happen in the, in the last days. And uh, the best place to read about this is the book of Joel, the pouring out of God's spirit. And I believe, this is my opinion, that, that it is very possible and it will happen eventually. Absolutely. But this is a good time for it, considering all the signs we see, considering the troubles in this world escalating in uh, hundreds, dozens and dozens of ways, troubles, troubles, and more troubles, that this would be a good day for the outpouring in Joel too. Now, what I want to do is talk about how in my opinion, this does not, this is not the rapture. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I don't know what I'm going to entitle this, but I've, I've, I wanted to draw people to the aspect of what's called the rapture because that's anticipated. And if you, if you're spending your time on YouTube and following these kind of more religious things, you'll see all kinds of people predicting that, that, uh, the Feast of Weeks, or oh, well, in Hebrew, it, it's Shavuot. So it's the same word. Shavuot means Feast of Weeks in English. Anyway, there's all kinds of people predicting that the rapture will happen. Now, what I want to explain is, and I've said this quite a number of times, that I believe the first step is that the bride is identified, is marked. That's how it's put in the book of Revelation 7, 1 to 8. It's marked. Uh, my newest timeline proposal uh, is that the 1260 days was complete on Lamb Selection Day. But then Revelation 7, 1 to 8 began. It appears from Scripture to be a period of time that God takes to mark 144,000 people. Now, that's, this is the Lord's mark. Uh, those who are picked don't necessarily know who they are. And it is hoped that all of you hope to be among them. Uh, you know, understanding how the pieces of Scripture all fit together shows that the bride is something that's very important and Many have been teaching this, that 144,000 is the bride. I teach that. And then we have a second group called the attendants in the, in the Aramaic, the friends of the groom and the friends of the bride, using the metaphor of a wedding party. 
they also are involved in this. Now they get left behind as I've described, but they know they then know clearly who they are, but they have an important job to do and they will have God's protection. Now in Rick Joyner's vision, and I, which I've re referred to many, many times, and I'm I'm even gonna take a, a leap of faith here and say that Rick Joyner's vision came directly from God and Rick's job was to copy it down as accurately as possible and keep his own thoughts, his own theology, everything out of it. I'm going to say that's the same job that John had when he was given the book of Revelation, same job that Moses had when he was given uh, both the Torah and the book of Jubilees on Mount Sinai, that, that this vision copied down in the, in the uh, Final Quest Trilogy is a book from God. Okay? <laughs> Sounds a little radical, but I mean, it, it meets all the same qualifications, uh, in my opinion, as does Revelation and, uh, and Tor the Torah and the Book of Jubilees. And then, of course, all the rest, because, I mean, we're trusting that God inspired them all, right? That makes it God's work. Anyway, that revelation, uh, the Final Christ Trilogy, adds a lot of details. It, it's very, very helpful. And I pointed one of them out very recently, that as the final battle begins, which is the metaphor for the Great Tribulation, almost all believers are controlled by demons. Now, most people don't want to believe that. And, but, and I mean, I would never have said that. When I read that, I thought, whoa, that is, that's pretty wild. But in reality, when you, when you boil the whole thing down and see what God actually wrote compared to what churches and synagogues teach, it is, very accurate. The, the, the things that are taught are not right. They're not even close. There, there's, there's some smaller details that are correct. Uh, for instance, Yeshua uh, died so that we could have our sins forgiven. That's absolutely true. And as the, 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 Jewish people teach, or the, but don't do it, just like Christians, they don't do what they teach. <laughs> they say the, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings are the word of God, the truth. Well, truth is truth. You obey it. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for obedient people. Okay, now, uh, maybe before I... Forget this, I'm going to give you a list, list of scriptures. Um, these first two are the two famous ones for the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 13 to 18. And then I'm going to give you four scriptures here that talk about protection during the Great Tribulation. Malachi 3, 16 to 18. Revelation 3, 10. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21, Nahum 1, verse 7. And I'll, I'll put those all in my description, but this is something we, uh, we want to have a confidence that if we are obedient, and you can change that. If you're not obedient to God <clears throat> today, you have <clears throat> five at most and, and four, no. Six and five, because I got to include the Sabbath. You have that time to repent, and repentance is always the same thing. Repentance is turning away from sin, and uh, we humans do it imperfectly. But we, if we haven't made that decision to remove sin from our life, even one sin we know about, then we haven't repented. So there's still time to do something about this to change your belief system. If you've bought Christian and Jewish 
doctrine, then you don't know what sin is. If you buy truth, if you read 1 John 3, 4, uh, stated very simply, sin is the transgression of the Torah, then if you accept that, then you can identify what sin is, and then you can do something about it. So there's still a few days to do that, if you haven't done it yet. If, if you haven't seen clearly because you've been mistaught, then you can correct that. And you can have protection during the Great Tribulation. There's not a promise there to remove it from us from the Tribulation, if you read those four scriptures. Uh, that I gave you, Malachi, Revelation, Isaiah, Nahum. So how does this stuff all add up? This is what I'm, so I'm going to try and explain this, what i got 35 minutes, i got a few minutes left. Um, uh, Julie Wedby, I think, is the best source to, to unravel this idea that what's coming up here, what we're predicting, is not the so-called rapture. What it is, it, uh, Julie described it as a partial translation. What I would call it is what we see in the book of Joel, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And we've seen it many, many times. We've got all kinds of examples of it. Uh, we see the shadow of Peter healing people when he's not even cognizant of what was going, of that going on. That God caused that person to be healed as his shadow passed over. Uh, how about uh, when David killed the bear and the lion with his bare hands and killed Goliath with a small smooth stone? Um, uh, there's just hundreds and hundreds of, of examples of what people can do with the power of God in them and on them. The Spirit of God outpoured. So that is what I'm uh, going to propose is going to happen if it does indeed happen on the, on the day of the Feast of Weeks, which would be the 27th, 28th. And remember, days start at sunset. Not everything in Satan's Babylonian system is different from God's system. So what you're looking at is you're waiting for the sign of the moon, you know, the, the seventh Sabbath, and then you know you have one day left. It happens at sunset. So you go through that Sabbath day, and then sunset the next evening is the beginning of the Feast of Weeks, whenever the sun sets, wherever you are in this world. Up, up here in Canada, we have long, long days in the summer and short, short days in the winter. Okay, so uh, I think that that's what could very well happen on the Feast of Weeks. On that particular day, I just pointed out that it's 27th, 28th, 26th. You look for the signs wherever you live on earth. And at sunset is the beginning of that day. And if you have, have it off, I don't think that's going to leave you behind because he's, he's going by your heart not your perfect theology. I'm just teaching what God has shown me. And a willing heart will learn. So anyway, the book of Joel is the best source to read of what is going to happen there with this outpouring. I would, if you want to compare it to modern day uh, ideas, these people would be the X-Men, Superman. That Superman Wonder Woman and all these, you know, superpowers. Now, that, I'm adding a little bit of humor, but one of the things that's been predicted is that these 144,000 people will be able to uh, go anywhere on Earth in a moment. That's supernatural translation. They, they will have the ability to understand every language spoken on Earth and speak every language spoken on Earth. They will be given a full revelation of God's truth. They will absolutely teach 
the appointed times of the Lord. They will, they will do these four things that I uh, listed to you there from Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24. And the bridesmaids will be there as their assistants. They're the friends of the bride and friends of the groom. So we have this group of now about 150 million people. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, 1,500,000, about. You know, we got 144,000 plus a group that's 10 times that size. That is the group that are the two witnesses. They're made up of the two houses of Israel. They have these two messages. Uh, and up until this point, they have not accepted each other's message or witness, testimony. But from this point on, they will. They'll have both messages and work together. The healing of the two houses, which is described in, now is it Ezekiel 37, the last half. I'll put it in my description. But anyway, I'm out of time. I hopefully covered everything, so uh, please raise your expectations, uh, but for sure repent of your sins, and for sure ask God to fill you with your with His Holy Spirit, and it, it is the Holy Spirit that teaches us all things, not the church or the synagogue. They have their place, but they haven't been doing. Uh, what they should be doing. Anyway, I better go. God bless you, and uh, hopefully see you soon, one way or another.